Chapter 3, Mechanics and Dynamics of Charting. Learning Objectives. After studying this chapter, you should be able to understand chart construction and how technical data is incorporated and displayed. Describe the process by which OHLC data is created and its relationship to various charts. Identify and differentiate between contango and backwardation and understand the connection with negative and positive roll yields. Understand the adverse effects of the bid-ask spread on trading performance. Construct various charts using constant measures of time, range volatility, trade volume, UME, and number of transactions. Set up a volatility neutral chart for consistent viewing of price action. Traditional charting is a two-dimensional matrix upon which technical data are Information is viewed, it affords the practitioner a means of tracking technical data in a meaningful way, revealing various repetitive price pattern behavioral traits and market volatility. In addition, charting also clearly reveals price distortions and illiquidity in the market. It allows for the application of technical analysis such as the drawing of trend lines, channels, envelopes, and chart patterns on price, helping to uncover important price reaction levels which are driven by the consistent underlying psychology and perception of all market participants. In this chapter, we shall cover the basics of chart construction and how technical data is displayed. 3.1 The Mechanics and Dynamics of Charting There are many ways that a technical analyst can analyze and display market data. Data may be displayed either in a numerical or graphical form. All numerical data may be displayed graphically, if required. Analysts using numerical 65, 92 information to study market action may also resort to various quantitative and statistical techniques in an attempt to predict future price direction and volatility. These quantitative analysts and statisticians employ various forms of time series and stochastic analysis and conduct back and forward testing on technical data. They also try to identify price anomalies and arbitrage opportunities using sophisticated software programs and high-speed data connectivity. More traditional analysts prefer to work using only a graphical representation of technical data, which comes in the usual form of a price time chart, where the Vertical axis tracks the movement of price and the horizontal axis tracks the motion of time. The price axis may be scaled in an arithmetic, linear, or logarithmic ratio fashion. On some charts, the time axis may not always be plotted in equal increments or units of time, but rather acting more as a counter for new blocks of data rather than an explicit representation of the passing of time. On such charts, time is regarded as implicit along the x-axis. Traditional analysts study classical chart patterns, trend lines, window oscillators, overlay indicators, and various other price formations. Analysts who use charts to study technical data are called chartists. Note that quantitative analysts and statisticians also tend to use charts to display numerical data, although it is optional. Technical data. Some of the more common technical data are information employed to construct. Charts include price data, open, O, high, H, low, L, close, C, transaction related data, volume, V, open interest, OI, market breadth data, advances, O, declines, D, total issues, T, up volume, down volume, UV, DV, new highs, new lows, NH, NL, Bullish percent data, a sentiment data, put call ratio, short interest ratio, specialist public ratio, cash asset ratio, investor and advisor poll data, the margin debt, implied volatility, VIX 66, 93. The majority of charts are simple price time charts, using the basic open, high, low, and close information, popularly referred to as OHLC data. Let us now turn our attention to how OHLC data is created. Quantization of price. In order to create OHLC data, we first need to specify the time interval over which price activity occurs. 
For example, let us assume that we are interested in identifying the opening, high, low, and closing prices over five-minute intervals. We therefore need to separate or quantize price activity with respect to time for each successive five-min interval or period. An interval or period may be of any duration, but the most popular intervals are 1-min, 5-min, 15-min, 1-hour, 4-hour, daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly. In our example, the price at the beginning and end of any 5-min interval represents the opening O and closing C price respectively, while the highest and lowest price within that period represents the high H and low L prices. In most cases, the closing price will also represent the opening price of the next 5-min interval, unless there is a gap in price. Figure 3.1 depicts price activity within a 5-min period. Price is quantized into 5-min intervals and is summarized into four pieces of information, namely the OHLC data. Note that OHLC data is also used to construct other representations of price activity like bar charts, scan bars, and Japanese candlesticks. The range of a bar or a candlestick is simply the absolute difference between the high and low price that is range equals HL. Refer to figure 3.2. To create OHLC data for bars and candlesticks over long year periods, simply identify the 1. Opening price of the first period, O2. Closing price of the last period, C3. Highest price between the opening and closing price, H4. Lowest price between the opening and closing price, L. Figure 3.1 Filtering price action into four pieces of information OHLC 67, 94 Figure 3.2 Higher time frame price action represented by composite combination Bar We observe the creation of a 15-minute bar and candlestick in Figure 3.2 via such a process. This method may be used over any duration to create bars in Candlesticks of longer or multiple periods, normally referred to as higher time frame bars and candlesticks. Hence, a 15-minute bar represents a bar that is associated with a higher time frame, unlike 5 or 10-minute bars. Figure 3.3 shows a series of OHLC-based bars and its equivalent candlesticks being formed by the quantization of price into 5-minute intervals or periods. Figure 3.3 The Quantization Filtering of Price Action 68 95 Figure 3.4 OHLC as the basis of most chart constructions. OHLC data is therefore simply a summary of price activity within a certain interval or period. The longer the duration of the interval or period of the resulting OHLC data, the higher will be the time frame associated with such bars and candlesticks. As can be seen in Figure 3.4, most charts are created from basic OHLC data, with the exception of the equivalent chart, which requires additional information on volume in order to construct its bars. In short, equivalent bars require OHLC B data, with V representing volume. Figure 3.5 illustrates three different representations of the same sequence of OHLC data in the form of line, bar, and candlestick chart. When viewing charts, it is always best to turn off the auto-scaling feature. Auto-scaling attempts to fill the entire screen with price activity. As such, the heights of Bars and candlesticks constantly change depending on whether price is ranging or trending. If prices are flat or ranging, it will expand all price activity and attempt to stretch it across the entire screen, making low volatility activity seem more volatile. By increasing the height of all the bars and candlesticks on the screen. Conversely, when prices are trending, auto scaling will shorten the height of all bars on the Figure 3.5 Examples of Various OHLC-Based Charts Source MetaTrader 4 69 96 Figure 3.6 Example of Auto-Scaling Misrepresenting Volatility
screen in order to fit in the trend action, making volatile price activity look less volatile. In short, the vertical scaling is not preserved or constant. Switching off the auto scaling function normalizes volatility on the charts, allowing for more accurate price visualization. Referring to the top two charts in figure 3.6, we observe a CER twin region of price activity encircled being portrayed as more volatile than it really is by virtue of increasing the height of all its bars when prices across the screen are ranging or flattish. We see the encircled area of activity suddenly shrink in the top right chart once auto scaling fits in a subsequent trend. In the bottom two charts, we see prices maintaining the bar heights in spite of a subsequent trend appearing on the screen. In short, auto scaling makes it very difficult to gain familiarity with the subtle nuances of price behavior occurring at various time frames of activity. It drastically misrepresents volatility on the charts. Significance of OHLC data. Although HLC data is the result of filtering price activity over a specified interval or period, not all data have similar significance. The opening and closing prices are merely a function of time stamping, that is, of confining price activity to within an arbitrary time interval. See figure 3.7. Once that interval is completed, the prices at that instant, i.e., on that timeline, mark the closing price of the previous and in most cases, the opening price of the new current bar. The situation is vastly different in the case of the high and low prices, which are created by actual market forces of supply and demand. The highs and lows represent areas of price rejection caused by the responsive actions of market participants. Traders in investors are reacting to high and low prices by risking capital in the markets. This makes the high and low prices more significant when compared to opening and 70, 97, figure 3.7 significance of OHLC data. Closing prices. It should be noted that the longer the interval or period, the more significant will be the high and low prices formed. Nevertheless, opening and closing prices begin to gain more importance and attention from market participants, making such prices more reliable and actionable. If the durations between active trading sessions are longer, the opening and closing prices are created over a longer interval, i.e., belonging to a higher time frame bar or a candlestick. There are larger price gaps between the previous closing and new opening. Prices. See figure 3.8. Longer durations between active trading sessions increase. The psychological importance and significance of opening and closing prices. As such daily opening and closing prices are generally of greater interest to market. Figure 3.8. Significance of opening and closing prices. 71. 98. Participants than the intraday opening and closing prices between the morning and afternoon trading sessions since there is a longer duration of non-trading. Activity on an intraday basis is compared to periods of non-trading activity between the intraday trading sessions. In markets where the trading is continuous, opening and closing prices have lesser importance as compared to high and low. Prices, as in the case of the spot foreign exchange FX market which trades continuously through the week from Sunday evening to the Friday close. Generally speaking, opening and closing prices are also of greater significance if they belong to a higher time frame bar or a candlestick. Opening and closing prices belonging to a daily bar are psychologically more significant than those belonging to a one or five minute bar. Finally, the larger the price gap between the last closing and new opening price, the greater the significance and importance of the opening and closing prices. 3.2 Gap Action 4 Types of Gaps There are essentially four ways to define a gap which is represented by a range of prices where no trading activity takes place. Type 1 A gap measured from the close of the previous bar to the open of the next. Our current bar, it is created instantaneously at the open. 
There is an instant jump in prices either up or down with no trading activity taking place between the two prices. Type 2, a gap measured from the high or low of the previous bar to the open of the next or current bar, it is created instantaneously at the open. There is no trading activity within that price range. Type 3, a gap measured from the highs or lows of the previous bar to the highs or lows of the next or current bar, it is created only after the next or current bar has closed. This is the gap usually referred to as a window in Japanese candlestick or bar charts. It is also the type of gap referred to frequently when studying breakaway, runaway, also called measuring or midway, and exhaustion gaps, although types 1 and 4 gaps are also sometimes referred to when studying such formations. Type 4, a gap measured from the close of the previous bar to the high or low of the next bar, it is created after the next or current bar has closed. There is no trading activity within the price range from the close of the previous bar to the low or high of the next or current bar. See figure 3.9. It should be noted that a gap itself normally represents an area of support or resistance depending on whether price is above or below it. This is especially so when the gap created is a type 3 gap. The gap or price window increases in significance and importance with larger gaps. Prices are also generally expected to return to fill the gap at a later date, although there are many instances where this does not occur. Finally, it may be of interest to the reader to know that the average true range ATR is somewhat related to a type 4 gap, where the true range is either the range of the new bar or distance between the close of the last bar and the high or low of the new bar, depending on whichever is greater. 72, 99, figure 3.94 types of gapping action representing areas of non-trading activity. We shall be covering gaps in more detail in Chapter 5, where we will be analyzing gaps in relation to market phase. The four main types of gap covered are 1, common gaps, 2, breakaway gaps, 3, runaway continuation, midway gaps. 4. Exhaustion gaps 3.3 Constant chart measures. There are five types of constant measure charts, namely 1. Constant time charts bar closes when a specified time interval is met for. Example, candlestick charts bar charts equivalum charts. 2. Constant range charts bar closes when a specified excursion in price is met for example, point and figure charts and Renko charts. 3. Constant volume charts bar closes when a specified volume is met. 4. Constant transaction tick charts bar closes when a specified number of transactions trades is met. 5. Constant volatility charts bar closes when a specified amount of standard deviation or ATR is met. Constant time charts. Constant time charts quantize price activity into units of time or intervals. Each bar is complete once a specified amount of time has elapsed. Hence, such charts are also referred to as interval charts. Below are the characteristics associated with constant time charts. The bar range is variable. The bar duration is constant. 73, 100. The bar volume is variable. The transactions per bar is variable. The bar volatility is variable. Examples of constant time charts include Japanese candlestick bar, equivalent, and line charts. Constant time charts work effectively with both numerically and geometrically based overlay indicators. Refer to Chapter 8 for more on numerical, geometrical, and horizontal based indicators. Non-constant time based charts should use numerical and horizontal based overlay indicators since the time axis is not plotted in a linear fashion and hence will affect the application of geometrically based overlays such as trend line, channel, and traditional chart pattern analysis. This is the reason why non-constant time-based charts such point and figure charts employ bearish resistance and bullish support lines in place of conventional trend lines. Constant time charts represent the most popular form of chart construction.
Bar charts is seen in figure 3.1. A bar chart is easily created via the quantization of price into specified time intervals or periods. Bar charts clearly depict levels of supply and demand in the market. Unfortunately, opening and closing prices are harder to read from a distance as the open and close markers may be too indistinct when the chart is populated with a large number of bars. Line charts Line charts are created by connecting all of the closing prices. Each time interval creates a new closing price. Line charts do not provide much information about potential levels of supply and demand since they ignore high-end low prices which are the true indicators of market force. Nevertheless, because line charts filter out all information except closing prices, they are usually employed as a trend identifier or simple summary of price activity. Japanese candlestick charts Japanese candlesticks are created in essentially the same manner as standard price bars. As seen in figures 3.1 to 3.3, the only DIF difference is that the space between the opening and closing price is boxed up and is referred to as the real body. Real bodies may be filled or hollow depending on the configuration or relative position of the opening price to the closing price. Real bodies may also be represented as black or white candlesticks. Candlestick formations may be classified as follows. 1. Bullish or bearish. 2. Reversal or continuation. 3. Simple, double, or multiple. We shall be delving more deeply into candlestick formations in Chapter 14. For now, refer to Figure 3.10. As with price bars, it is not possible to determine whether the high or low prices were created first, since most of the interbar price information has been filtered out. Equivalum charts Equivalum charts are based on constant time-based bars, incorporating volume over a specified time interval and displaying it visually on 74, 101. Figure 3.10 Bullish and Bearish Japanese Candlesticks The charts in terms of bar width rather than height. Equivalum bars are constructed using high and low prices. Open and close prices are disregarded. Larger Volume over a particular interval or period will result in a wider bar. Because of the variable bar width, the horizontal or time axis is not plotted in a linear fashion, even though equivalum bars represent constant time-based bars. As such, geometrically based overlay indicators such as trend lines, channels, and chart patterns are somewhat affected or distorted when applied to such charts. Figure 3.11 clearly depicts the non-linear increments along the horizontal or time axis on the daily equivalum chart of Apple Inc. Notice that the trend lines intersect the figure 3.11 comparing a Japanese candlestick to an equivalum chart, courtesy of StockCharts.com, 75, 100, Two, vertical or price axis at different prices. Conversely, numerical and horizontal based overlay indicators are not affected by the non-linear axial increments on equivalum charts. Constant range charts. On constant range charts, each bar, box, or brick is complete once a specified excursion in price is met. Examples of constant range charting include Renko and point and figure charts. Below are the characteristics associated with constant range charts. The bar or box range is constant. The bar or box duration is variable. The bar or box volume is variable. The transactions per bar is variable. The bar or box volatility is constant. Point and figure charts Point and figure charts represent the most popular form of constant range charting. Once a specified amount of price excursion is Recorded or detected, a new bar is plotted. These bars are referred to as boxes. Point and figure charts are populated by continuation and reversal boxes. A continuation box specifies the minimum price excursion required for a new box to be plotted in the direction of the existing trend. 
the reversal size consists of a specified number of boxes required for a reversal to be plotted on the charts. The size of the boxes is arbitrarily chosen. For example, a $1 box size requires price to move at least $1 before a new box is plotted, and if the reversal size is 3 boxes price will be required to move at least 3 times $1 equals $3 before a reversal may be plotted. On the chart, closing prices are normally used to determine the completion of a box, although many practitioners also use the high and low prices. Rising prices are indicated by a column of rising X's, whereas declining prices are indicated by a column of falling O's. As constant range charts, the time axis is non-linear and as a consequence, geometrically based overlay indicators would exhibit inconsistent readings. This is the main reason why point and figure charting uses a unique form of trend lines which are not based on drawing a line between two points. Only one point is required and the trend lines rise and fall along 45 and minus 45 degree angles. See figure 3.12. Ranko charts. Ranko charts are another form of constant range charting. The Ranko bars are referred to as bricks. There are bullish white bricks and bearish black bricks. They are very similar to point and figure charting except that each new brick is plotted in a new column. A new brick is plotted once the minimum price excursion required for a new brick to be created is met. Since the creation of a new brick is not time dependent, the time axis is plotted in a non-linear fashion. All reversals require price to move at least two bricks in the opposite direction. Hence, Ranko charts are essentially two brick reversal charts. Again, the size of the brick is arbitrarily chosen. See figure 3.13. 76. 103. Figure 3.12. A point and figure chart of Google Inc. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Constant volume charts. In constant volume charts, a new bar is plotted once the minimum volume UME traded is met. Below are the characteristics associated with constant volume charts. The bar range is variable. The bar duration is variable. Figure 3.13 Aranko Chart of iPath Dow Jones AIG Coffee Total Return Sub Index. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. 77. 104. The bar volume is constant. The transactions per bar is variable. The bar volatility is variable. Since the creation of a new bar is not time dependent, the time axis is plotted in a non-linear fashion. Constant transaction tick charts. In constant transaction or tick charts, a new bar is plotted once the minimum number of transactions for a new bar to be created is met. Below are the characteristics associated with constant transaction charts. The bar range is variable. The bar duration is variable. The bar volume is variable. The transactions per bar is constant. The bar volatility is variable. Each transaction is represented by one tick. Therefore, five ticks indicate that five transactions took place. Note that the volume associated with each Transaction is unspecified, though it may be inferred, depending on the market. Traded. The time axis for constant transaction charts is plotted in a non-linear fashion. Constant volatility charts. In constant volatility charting, each new bar is plotted once the minimum price. Excursion for the creation of new bar is met. Below are the characteristics associated with constant volatility charts. The bar range is variable. The bar duration is variable. The bar volume is variable. The transactions per bar is variable. The bar volatility is constant. This difference between this form of charting and constant range charting is that the minimum price excursion required is determined by price volatility. For example, we could set up a chart whereby each new bar is plotted once the 
minimum price excursion of two times ATR is met. In a sense it is objective, as the bar size is determined by market volatility. Nevertheless, it is also subjective in so far as the choice in the number of multiples of ATR to be employed is concerned. Figure 3.14 illustrates the use of a point and figure chart where the box size is set to 1 times ATR. Notice its use of constant volatility charting to identify trends more effectively as compared to regular constant range charting, as seen on the right-hand side of the illustration. 78, 105, figure 3.14 comparing constant volatility to constant range charting. Courtesy of StockCharts.com. Chart constructs with no measures of constancy. There exist certain chart constructs where there exist no measures of constancy. This implies that the range, duration, volume, number of transactions, and volatile ITY of each bar is variable. Three line break charts. Three line break charts are unique in that they possess no measures of constancy. Once price closes above the previous high, or below a previous low, a new line is created. Once three successive lines are created, a reversal may only be plotted if price meets or exceeds the low, or high, in an upside reversal of the last three periods in a downside reversal. There are bullish white lines and bearish black lines. See figure 3.15 for a comparison between three line break and Ranko charting for the currency. Shares Euro Trust. Chart scaling There are three basic types of scaling employed when creating price charts, namely the 1. Linear or arithmetic scale 2. Ratio or logarithmic scale 3. Square root scale. The most common scalings used are the linear and ratio scalings. The square root scale lies somewhere between the linear and ratio scales with respect to its scale increments. It is not commonly used on most platforms. 79, 106, figure 3.15 comparing three line break with Renko charting on the currency shares euro. Trust, courtesy of stockcharts.com. In linear scaling, equal distances on the chart represent equal price changes. This would imply that equal price changes at higher prices would result in lower percentage changes. For example, a price change from $10 to $20 would represent a $10 change in price and a 100% change in price that is $20 minus $10, $10 times 100%. A price change from $90 to $100 would also represent a change of $10 in price but at this higher price level, its percentage change is merely $100 minus $90, $90 times 100% equals 11.1%. Hence, for linear scaling, the percentage change is not preserved for equal units of price. If PN represents the north price, then linear scaling simply means that PN, PN minus 1, is a constant for every equal distance move on the chart. See figure 3.16. In ratio scaling, equal distances on the chart represent equal price percentage changes. This would imply that equal percentage changes at higher prices would result in larger price changes. For example, an equal percentage change of 100% based on a price change from $10 to $20 would require a price change of $90 at the $90 price level, that is, the price difference between the $180 and $90 price level. Hence, for ratio scaling, the price change is not preserved per equal units of percentage change. This also means that equal distances on the chart does not equate to equal percentage changes. Figure 3.16 Linear Scaling 80 107 Figure 3.17 Ratio Scaling If PN represents the north price, then ratio scaling simply means that PN, PN minus 1, per p is a constant for every equal distance move on the chart. Figures 3.17 and 3.18 Show how the percentage increments need to rise to account for an equal price change. This formula represents what is also referred to as stock returns. 
the ratio scale tends to compress price action at higher prices and expand it at lower prices, whereas linear scaling represents price evenly across the entire price range. Consequently, for very large price differences, linear scaling will not represent price activity clearly at lower prices due to the ever-increasing price range. That is made to fit on one chart, but it would reveal upper price activity with better clarity when compared to ratio scaling, which tends to compress upper price ACT on, making it relatively more difficult to observe price patterns and volatility behavior. But a log scale would reveal lower price action with more clarity. In short, linear scaling provides better upper end definition and visualization of prices, but relatively poor clarity at lower prices. Ratio scaling provides better lower end definition and visualization of prices, but relatively poor clarity at higher prices. As a general guideline, use linear charts when the price range under observed T on is relatively small. For stock price ranges exceeding $100, it may be more appropriate to use ratio charting. It is also best to employ ratio charts for viewing. Figure 3.18 Ratio Scaling 81. 108. Very long-term market action. This mainly applies to the equity markets. 4. Charts based on futures or foreign exchange contracts, including any instrument being traded on very low margin, i.e., very high leverage, linear charts would be more suitable, as ratio charts would compress price too much at higher prices. When applying technical analysis to price, the type of scaling may affect the forecasting of potential support and resistance levels, introducing inconsistencies and discrepancies in the forecasted levels of potential price reaction. This affects all overlays that rely on geometry in their construction such as trend lines, channels, and chart patterns. Consequently, if the scaling changes, the angles of all trend lines will also change accordingly, indicating different levels of potential support and resistance. Scaling does not affect overlays that are constructed numerically, like moving averages and price envelopes. It also does not affect overlay indicators that indicate horizontal levels of support and resistance like prior support and resistance levels, Fibonacci extensions, retracements, projections, and expansions, GAN 1 8 and 1 3rd price retracements, GAN square of 9 price projections. It should be noted that if square root scaling is employed, it will indicate an uptrend line penetration that is later than that for ratio scaling but earlier than an Uptrend line penetration based on a linear scale. This is rather disconcerting, as the majority of traders will react to violations of the uptrend line based on either linear or ratio scaling. Hence, a trader utilizing square root scale charting will find him or herself initiating entries and exits either too early or too late with respect to important and significant price reaction levels in the market. Insofar as drawing uptrend and downtrend lines using linear and ratio scaling, it behooves the practitioner to note the following. Uptrend lines are penetrated sooner while downtrend lines are penetrated later on ratio or logarithmically scaled charts. Uptrend lines are penetrated later while downtrend lines are penetrated sooner on linear or arithmetically scaled charts. See figures 3.19 and 3.20. Switching between linear and ratio scaling may also result in the following. Declining prices may take on a potentially bearish appearance with prices accelerating as they decline in a convex type fashion, resembling a downward parabolic move on ratio or logarithmically scaled charts. Rising prices may take on a potentially bearish appearance with prices decelerating as they rise in a concave type fashion, resembling a flattening adder. Rounding top formation on ratio or logarithmically scaled charts. Declining prices may take on a potentially bullish appearance with prices decelerating as they decline into a concave type fashion, resembling a flattening. Outer rounding bottom formation on linear or arithmetically scaled charts. 82. 109.
Figure 3.19 Comparing Uptrend Line Penetrations on Linear and Ratio Charts on the SPDR Dow Jones Industrial Average, courtesy of StockCharts.com. Rising prices may take on a potentially bullish appearance with prices accelerating as they rise or rising evenly in a convex-type fashion, resembling an upward parabolic move or steadily rising prices on linear or arithmetically scaled charts. See figures 3.21 and 3.22. Figure 3.23 highlights the discrepancies between linear and ratio scaled charting when drawing price channels based on identical price inflection points. Geometrically based barrier overlays give rise to inconsistencies when compared using Figure 3.20 comparing downtrend line penetrations on linear and ratio charts on the U.S. Natural Gas Fund, courtesy of StockCharts.com, 83, 110. Figure 3.21 Comparing Linear and Ratio Scaling on the Daily Chart of A123 Systems, Inc., courtesy of StockCharts.com. Figure 3.22 Comparing Linear and Ratio Scaling on the Daily Chart of Apple Inc., courtesy of StockCharts.com, 84, 111. Figure 3.23 Comparing Channels on Linear and Ratio Scaling on the Daily Chart of Energy Services of America Corp. Courtesy of StockCharts.com Different Chart Scaling Note that numerically based barrier overlays like moving avenue or ridges are not affected by chart scaling and display no discrepancies in their readings. The bid-based chart and bid-ask spread charts are typically drawn-based. On bid prices, although many charting platforms also allow for the display of price action based on ask and mid prices, the use of bid based price charts has a significant effect on trading chart patterns, pullbacks, and breakouts by virtue of the spread between the bid and ask prices. It is also dependent on whether we are buying at the ask, buying at the bid, selling at the ask, selling at the bid. In general, trade performance is generally adversely affected when initiating long entries and executing long exits on bid-based charts. It does not specifically affect short entries or short exits. Nevertheless, since a trade consists of a buy and a sell at the bid-ask spread affects all trades. Initiating short entries on bid-based charts allows the trader to enter at the precise price level intended. For example, assume that we want to short at a prior resistance level of $10. Assume that the bid ask spread, that is, the price difference. 85, 112, figure 3.24 shorting resistance at the bid. Between the bid and ask price is 20 cents. The moment we see price on the bid based chart test the $10 level, we enter a market order to short at $10, ignoring the possibility of negative slippage for now, we are filled at $10. There seems to be no difficulty in establishing a short at the intended price. The outcome is similar to using a pending order to initiate a short entry. If we placed a sell limit order at $10, we should also be filled at that intended price or better. Even if the short represented an exit such as stop loss or profit target, we would still be able to exit at the intended price. This is because we are shorting, i.e., selling to open or close a position at the bid, i.e., sell price. There seem to be no difficulties associated with initiating short entries or exits at the intended price on a bid-based chart. See, figure 3.24. Now let us turn our attention to long entries. Let us assume that we intend to Go long on an upside breakout, initiating an entry 5 cents above the $10 breakout level. 
We see prices test the $10.05 level and we immediately initiate a market order. We then find out that we had actually entered at $10.25 instead of $10.05. This is because when we enter in order to buy, we need to accept the ask price which is $0.20 cents above the bid price. Hence, even though we have initiated a long position at precisely the right time of entry based on a bid price chart, we never tell us bought in at a higher price that we had intended. This is referred to as the problem of the expensive longs. See figure 3.25. Assume now that we initiate the same entry, but this time using a pending order in the form of a buy stop entry order. We place a buy stop order to go long at $10.05 just as before. We later find that we were filled at exactly $10.05. Unfortunately, when the buy stop order was filled at the ask price of $10.05, the bid price was still below the $10 breakout level, being $0.20 cents below the ask price at $9.85. This essentially means that we have bought into a position before the breakout based on the resistance level on bid price chart. This is referred to as the problem of the early longs. Traders therefore have no choice but to buy in at a relatively higher price which reduces the profit potential or to buy in too early at the exact intended price. Either way, the bid ask spread adversely affects both long instantaneous and pending order entries. Let us now look at how the bid ask spread affects long entries in declining markets. Let us now imagine that we intend to buy at the prior support level of $10. We see price test the $10 level and we immediately enter a market order to go long. 86, 113, figure 3.25 going long at the breakout. We soon find out that we bought in at $10.20 that is, at the ask price. Again, we encountered the problem of the expensive longs. This occurred because the very moment the market order was filled, the ask price was $0.20 cents above the support level as viewed on a bid price chart. Assume now that we place a pending order to buy in at $10. We soon find out that we were filled at exactly $10, that is, at the ask price that we had originally intended to be filled at in the market. Unfortunately, when we were filled at $10, the bid price was already below the support level at $9.80 as viewed on the bid price chart. This means that we bought into a support level after it was already reached. This is referred to as the problem of the late blongs. See figure 3.26. The bid ask spread also affects the reward to risk ratios. The spread increases the probability of exiting at the stop loss loss promoting, reduces the probability of exiting at the profit profit restricting. With market orders, the spread is deducted from the profit and added to the loss, which is reflected in the trading account. In figure 3.27, a trader buys when the bid price was at $1. Since the bid ask spread was $0.20, cents, the trader went long at $1.20. With a profit target at $1.50, the maximum profit would be $0.30, cents, instead of $0.50. Cents. But for a stop size of $0.50, cents, the maximum would be $0.70, cents, instead of $0.50, cents. hence the actual spread adjusted reward to risk ratio R, R ratio is Figure 3.26 going long at support 87. 114. Figure 3.27 buying based on bid prices on the charts. 0 0.43 and not 1. Hence the spread adversely affects the R, R ratio for instantaneous. Long market order entries executed based on bid prices. With pending orders, the spread is not deducted from the profit are added. To the loss in is not reflected in the trading account. The spread cost is hidden within the dynamics of the pending order set up such that to make a profit price has to traverse a greater distance, whereas for a loss price has only to move a relatively shortly distance. As such, for long entry pending orders, the spread does not 
alter expected the R, R ratio, but it does adversely affect the probability of securing a successful trade by virtue of the amount of work that the market has to do in order to generate profit and the ease of being stopped out. See figure 3.28 to mitigate the adverse effects of the spread on the reward to risk ratio for instantaneous long entries based on bid prices on the chart the trader needs to figure 3.28 buying based on ask prices via pending orders 88 115 Increase the ratio of target size and stop size over the spread. The most obvious way to accomplish this is to trade at a higher time frame or on a larger wave cycle. The larger the absolute size of the profit target and stop loss, the less will be the relative cost of trading against the spread. The spread affects the short-term trader the most, especially scalpers, and that is why they need to buy at the bid and sell at the ask price in order to reduce the cost of trading. A standard level 1 L1 trading platform will not allow traders to buy at the bid or sell at the ask price. 3.4 Futures Contracts Futures contracts were originally created to allow commodity producers a means of hedging against falling prices and hence they are essentially a bearish mechanism. By shorting an equal amount in the futures market producers need not worry about falling prices during harvest time. They have already locked in production costs in any potential profit irrespective of future prices rising or declining. Depending on when the goods are ready for sale, producers may choose nearby or further out futures contracts to hedge their costs and lock in any profit. Unlike equity markets in the futures market all contracts eventually expire, requiring the trader who intends to hold on to a position to roll over into the next available contract. Contracts are available at various expiration months but, usually every quarter in March, June, September and December, extending out beyond a year in many cases. A futures contract is normally fairly illiquid through its lifespan until the last three to six months before expiry. Volume and open interest are greatest around two to three months before expiry. As it approaches expiry, volume subsides as traders begin rolling over into the next available contract. It should be noted that this decline in volume toward the expiry of a contract may cause some confusion and may even lead an analyst to believe that any trend present is potentially weak. Due to the decreasing volume and open interest, a quick peek at the next nearby contract will normally show that volume is in fact increasing over the same period as traders pile into the next contract. Hence, to gauge the true volume and open interest action across rollover points, a continuous chart should be employed. See, figure 3.29. Figure 3.30 shows the volume over the same period using a continuous contract. We observe that we are now able to visualize continuity and volume action across multiple contracts rather than isolated instances of volume action within each separate futures contract. When trying to decide on the most appropriate contract to trade, look for the contract with the largest volume and open interest. This may not always be the nearby contract. It is also best to roll over slightly before expiry in order to avoid the volatility caused by traders exiting at the very last stages of the contract. The contract with the closest expiry is referred to as the nearby, nearest, or front month contract. The next available contract further out is referred to as 89, 116. Figure 3.29 Comparing Volume Action on the Daily Chart of Silver July and September 2011 Futures, courtesy of StockCharts.com The next contract, it is the second further out contract with an expiry closest to the nearby contract. Contracts further out are also referred to as back month contracts.
traders may choose to continue rolling over into the next nearby or front month contract. They may also choose to only roll over into the next month contract that is two contracts further out instead of rolling over into the next nearby contract. Once liquidity starts to subside, traders will normally start to roll over into the next nearby contract. Sometimes traders may also enter into two. Figure 3.30 Volume Action on the Continuous Daily Chart of Silver Courtesy of StockCharts.com 90 117 Figure 3.31 Identifying the front, next, and back month future futures contracts, one closer and another further out to create a calendar spread. Or for other hedging purposes, the nearby or front month contract has a few distinguishing characteristics, such as an expiration date closest to the current date, the narrowest bid ask spread, the narrowest spread with respect to the spot price, the most liquid contract. Figure 3.31 shows quarterly contract months expiring over a 12-month period. Assume that we are currently in the month of March and that the March contract has already expired. We may now choose to participate in the June contract which represents the nearby or front month contract. We may instead choose to participate in the next month or next nearby contract that is the September contract. We may even consider, depending on the trading strategy, to participate in a far out or back month contract like the December or following March contract. Futures contract delivery months are given a letter of the alphabet for identify cation purposes, namely, F for January, G for February, H for March, J for April, K for May. M for June, N for July, Q for August, U for September, V for October, X for November, and Z for December. When a futures contract approaches expiry, traders begin to roll over into the next nearest contract with the next closest expiry. The new contract may not be trading at the same price as the nearby expiring contract. It may be trading at a Higher price requiring the trader to pay a premium in order to participate in the new contract. In such cases, we say that the new contract is trading at a premium. To the previous contract, traders are required to roll over at a premium and this will adversely affect the potential profitability of the trading campaign. It is not uncommon for successive new contracts to roll over at a premium, resulting in AC accumulated losses diminishing profits along the way. Hence it is actually possible to lose money by being long in a rising or sideways market if the rollover premiums are large enough. Rolling over at a premium causes the trader to experience negative roll yields. See figure 3.32. 91. 118. Figure 3.32 Losses from Negative Roll Yields Sometimes the next contract may be trading at a lower price, in which case the trader rolling over into the new contract will receive a payment. In such cases, we say that the new contract is trading at a discount to the previous contract. It is not uncommon for successive new contracts to roll over at a discount, resulting in Accumulated gains, boosting profits along the way. It is therefore actually possible to make a profit by being long in a declining or sideways market if the rollover discounts are large enough. Rolling over at a discount causes the trader to experience positive roll yields. See figure 3.33. Another interesting characteristic of futures contracts is that further out contracts may be trading as successively lower or higher prices compared to the nearby contract or spot price. When further out contracts are trading at successively higher prices when compared to the expected spot price at expiry, we say that the market is in normal contango. Conversely, if further out contracts are trading at successively lower prices when compared to the expected spot price at expiry, we 
say that the market is in normal backwardation. Sometimes the terms contango and backwardation, especially when the term normal is dropped, may also be used loosely to mean that further out contracts may be trading at successively lower or higher prices compared to the nearby contract or current spot price. This Figure 3.33 Profiting from Positive Roll Yields, 92. 119. Figure 3.34 Simple Contango Observed on the Daily Chart of 2012 Gold Futures. Courtesy of Stock Chart. Is of course an informal use of the terms, but nevertheless, it is common practice. Among futures traders, see Figure 3.34 for an example of this popular definition. Of simple contango, we observe the further out gold contracts trading at successively higher prices when compared to the nearby December contract. Although we observe simple contango, the contracts may or may not be in normal contango, which requires some knowledge of the expected or estimated spot price at expiry in order to determine if normal contango actually exists. One important aspect about futures contracts is that futures prices always converge to the spot price at expiry. Hence, if a contract is in contango and is summing that the spot price remains constant, it will eventually decline in price. Experiencing negative yields as it converges toward the lower spot price at expiry or maturity. Conversely, if a contract is in backwardation, it will eventually rise in price experiencing positive yields as it converges toward the higher spot price at expiry or maturity. Hence, in certain situations, especially with some mispricing, it may be possible to long a far out backward dated contract and simultaneously short a nearby contract gaining from the convergence as expiry approaches IR respective of the future direction of price. In short, a gain is locked in without any directional risk involved. Again, profitability depends on the spread and aggregate trading costs accumulated over the period of convergence toward expiry. See Figure 3.35. Figure 3.36 is an example of contango eroding returns in the natural gas market. During 2009, natural gas experienced a tremendous rally throughout 2009, which was not matched by the U.S. Natural Gas Fund which tracks natural gas prices via futures contracts. Although the market was rising, rolling over at relatively large 93, 120, figure 3.35 convergence of spot and futures prices at expiration. Premiums actually resulted in a loss of traders rolled over continuously. We see the U.S. Natural Gas Fund experiencing excessive negative real yield as it seriously underperforms gas prices. It should be noted that very short-term traders who trade individual contracts without having to roll over positions are not affected by negative real yields, nor do they profit from positive real yields. Figure 3.37 clearly shows the underperformance of the U.S. Natural Gas Fund with respect to prices in the natural gas market. As we have already seen, there may be a premium or discount gap between the nearby and the next contract. As far as traders are concerned, this only requires a payment or receipt of payment with respect to the price difference in number of contracts held at rollover. But for the chartist, the challenge is to find a way to preserve the continuity of prices across such price gaps. There are many ways to figure 3.36 comparing performance on the continuous daily chart of natural gas and the U.S. Natural Gas Fund, courtesy of StockCharts.com, 94, 121. Figure 3.37 Relative Strength Chart of the Continuous Daily Chart of Natural Gas Against the U.S. Natural Gas Fund Courtesy of StockCharts.com Represent this jointed data in a more meaningful manner. Here are some popular approaches Unadjusted Nearest Futures Contracts Back or Spread Adjusted Continuous Contracts
perpetual contracts. The simplest way to use charts of individual futures contracts is to just con NECT the nearest contracts without accounting for the gap that is unadjusted with respect to the price difference or spread between any two contracts. This approach preserves the actual sequence of nearby contract prices. It also serves as an AC curate record of historical prices. Even so, it is not possible to apply technical analysis in a meaningful way to such concatenations of disjointed contract prices. It also makes back and forward testing impossible due to the gaps between prices which are not representative of the actual price flow. See Figure 3.38. Figure 3.38 Unadjusted Nearest Futures Chart 95. 122. Figure 3.39 Identifying Price Discrepancies Between the Continuous Daily Chart of Gold and the December 2013 Gold Contract, courtesy of StockCharts.com. Another way to use concatenate charts of individual futures contracts is to raise or lower the previous contract price at expiry or at a certain end number of days before expiry to match the new contract price. This is referred to as back adjusting and it essentially removes the price difference or spread between contracts creating a continuous flow of prices between the individual contracts. It is advantageous insofar as it allows for the proper and meaningful application of technical analysis. In addition, back adjusted continuous charts always display the current price in the market and may therefore be used for trading purposes. It is also conducive to back and forward testing of trading strategies. Unfortunately, as a result of back adjusting, past prices do not reflect the actual traded contract prices during those periods. As such, past prices associated with significant peaks or troughs will continually change as prices are back adjusted to match new contracts. In figure 3.39, we observe that price peaks in the OHLC readings for November 7, 2011, differ between the continuous and the actual December 2013 gold contracts. Figure 3.40 shows how back adjusting is done. We observe the March contract expiring at $110, since the June contract is trading at $120, the March contract is raised so that its expiration price matches the new price that the June contract is trading in the market. This has the effect of raising the historical prices associated with the troughs in the March contract from $80 and $90 to $90 and $100 instead. Once the June contract expires the process repeats, and the entire series of prices are once again raised or lowered according to the price that the September contract is trading at in the market. If the entire 96, 123, figure 3.40 back adjusting in continuous charts series is raised by another $10 due to the September contract trading at a $10 premium, the historical prices associated with the troughs in the March contract will now be raised again from $90 and $100 to $100 and $110 instead. As can be seen, historical prices continue to undergo change and are adjusted to the net accumulated spread. Another disadvantage is that due to back adjusting, there is a possibility that past prices may become negative, especially if newer contracts are continually trading at a discount. This continual shifting of historical prices in back-adjusted continuous charts diminishes their use in relative strength analysis. Relative or comparative strength charts will not display accurate ratio relationships if past prices on continuous charts keep varying every time data is back-adjusted. In such cases, it would be better to use perpetual contracts as prices are not back-shifted with each new front month contract. Unfortunately, perpetual contracts do not display the current market price but rather an estimated price which is useless for trading purposes.
It estimates the newer further out rollover contract price by means of a weighting factor, interpolating the contract price between expiration dates. Nevertheless, perpetual contracts are useful when used as a basis for constructing relative strength charts. It does not introduce as much distortion in the ratio relationship, unlike continuous charts. 3.5 Chapter Summary In this chapter we learn how prices are filtered and used to construct various types of charts. We also observed how the bid-ask spread affects trading in R, R ratios as well as how linear and ratio chart scaling affects geometrically based overlay barriers such as trend lines and channels. The discussion on futures contracts highlighted the challenges that chartists face when trying to make sense of a sequence of individual futures contracts and how backwardation and contango affected profitability. The various chart constructs mentioned in this chapter will be analyzed in greater detail in subsequent chapters. 97, 124, Chapter 3 Review Questions 1. Explain how HLC data is derived. 2. Why should traders normalize their charts for volatility? 3. What are the factors that increase the significance of OHLC prices? 4. Describe the five measures of constancy in charting. 5. How does chart scaling affect the use of overlay indicators? 6. Explain the connection between contango and negative roll yields. 7. How does the bid-ask spread affect the reward-to-risk ratio? 8. Describe how back-adjusted continuous charts are constructed. References Murphy, John, 1999 Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets. New York, New York. Institute of Finance, NYIF. Nissen, Steve. 1994. Beyond Candlesticks. New York, John. 2001. Japanese Candlestick Charting Techniques. New York, New York Institute of Finance, NYIF. Schwager, Jackie. 1996. Schwager on Futures. New York, John Wiley and Sons.